Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It was very, very loud, and now it's very, very quiet. <laughs> try again. You want to try again? Okay. Test, test, test. Good morning. Good morning, Bob. Okay, I think that's. All right, good morning. I'd like to call the meeting of the contract review subcommittee for the city of Santa Rosa's Board of Public Utilities to order. If we may have a roll call, please. Yes. Board Member Grable? Here. Board Member Badenfort? And Chair Galvin. Here. Let the record reflect that all board members are present with the exception of board member Battenfort. Great. So item number two on our agenda is public comments on non-agenda matters. If you're in the room, please move to the microphone and wait for the timer. See no one move. We'll pass on item number two. We'll move to item 3.1. Director Burke. Thank you, Chair Galvin and members of the subcommittee. Our first item is the proposed professional services agreement, endowment and conservation easement holder for Kelly Farm Mitigation Bank. And Sean McNeil, Deputy Director of Environmental Services will be presenting. Good morning, Mr. McNeil, welcome. Good morning, Chair Galvin, uh, board member Grable. Um, I'm excited to be here to talk about the latest development on this project. Um, so, uh, so the proposed professional service agreement that we have here, uh, an endowment and conservation easement holder for Kelly Farm Mitigation Bank. Um, I'll go over a brief project overview, give you a current status with the project, uh, go through the RFP process, the request for proposal process that we went through, to get to this point, uh, the selection justification, and then our staff recommendation. So the project overview is, uh, this is a map of Kelly Farm uh, up there in the red highlighted area is a hundred acre section of that farm. Uh, and the proposal is to convert that area into a tiger salamander mitigation bank uh, preserve, which would be used for the water department's uh, mitigation needs. Um, we have a number of projects right now that we're working on that have significant mitigation needs, and this could save us a lot of money um, uh, to have our own bank developed. Um, this uh, back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, we did surveys on all of our city farms looking for tiger salamander. We did these drift net surveys where we put these um, barriers out that directed any um, tiger salamanders who might be moving at night into buckets for us to, um, to sample, uh, identify if they're there. This is part of the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, protocol level surveys that we did. And the only farm that we found tiger salamanders on was Kelly Farm. So it's of our farms, it's the best uh, for tiger salamanders. They're already there. Um, it's currently been leased for hay production uh, in, the, in the recent history. Um, and this bank would cease all irrigation on this part of the property. Uh, and enhance and expand the tiger salamander and wetland habitat uh, values on that, that part of the um, farm. The estimated costs for the, the bank have changed since the last time we um, presented to you um, as we've kind of been going through the process of getting uh, the regulatory agencies review on our plans they, uh, some of our cost saving measures uh, were not allowed and we were uh, forced to use different techniques in our construction of these wetlands. Uh, so that's uh, resulting in a, a greater increase to the construct estimated construction budget, but we still think it's cost effective. So I'll kind of walk you through it. Studies fees, permitting and design, we're estimating about $650,000. This is a permit heavy type of, of job to set this up. Uh, construction, uh, we're now estimating at $5 million. Originally, we thought it'd be more in the $2 million range. Um, interim monitoring and management, uh, $250,000. Uh, 
Um, and then the endowment would be uh, $2 million is our expected endowment for the full uh, management of this property. Today, the endowment, we're only talking about the uh, endowment that's part of this easement holder is for their work. So it's not for the work to maintain the bank in perpetuity. Uh, so we anticipate that the total would be around $2 million of an endowment that each year, uh, once we put that money up, each year all of our maintenance requirements for maintaining the bank in perpetuity should be covered um, by the proceeds from that endowment. Um, so there wouldn't be any future costs to the department. Uh, so the total of the project would be $7.9 million. Uh, the current cost uh, to purchase 100 acres of CTS credit, and I will throw in the caveat, if those credits existed, uh, is, is uh, at least $20 million. And this is a conservative estimate. This is at $200,000 a credit. We're seeing some prices up to $315,000 a credit. Uh, the market is a little bit volatile, but the problem is there just aren't that many credits available. So, for instance, the uh, flood study, the flood uh, wall around the Laguna treatment plant would require us to probably have anywhere from 30 to 60 credits, which would be 60, 30 to 60 acres of credit. There, there are no credits available in the, those uh, denominations. So it really is the only way that we would be able to move forward with some large projects. Uh, and it would come at a savings, even at this elevated construction cost of $12 million to the uh, department over time. So uh, we do think it's a, it's a good effort to continue to work on. Um, so the current status of the project is we've completed our biological surveys. Um, we've done the bank prospectus and it's been accepted by the resource agencies. Uh, so that's kind of setting out our plan for how we'll do this. We have 90% draft construction plans uh, and these uh, construction plans have uh, been uh, modified to meet the regulatory agency's uh, reviews of these. Um, and the contract today before you uh, provides the conservation easement. So there'll be the easement holder and endowment for those easement services. So it's just a component of the total of the $2 million for the easement, uh, but they would be the entity that would hold that money uh, on behalf of the city. And each year we would uh, specify what we've done to maintain the property, uh, and then they will give us that money back. Um, quick, quick question. I missed who is holding the easement. So it, it's with the contract. So um, we'll get to that. Oh, so okay. um, the RFP, uh, we advertised it on January 2nd uh, um, of this year. Two proposals were received by January, the deadline of January 30th of this year. Uh, the review panel uh, consisted of the Deputy Director of Environmental Services, me, uh, the Associate Civil Engineer, um, and a Senior Environmental Specialist. Uh, the evaluation criteria was responsiveness to our request for proposals, a work plan, uh, qualifications, ability to perform the work, experience, and technical ability. Staff unanimously selected the Center for Natural Lands Management, uh, due to greater experience with conservation easement management and a higher quality proposal. So that would be the entity that would hold the easement, would be the Center for Natural Lands Management. Um, so it is recommended by the Water Department that the uh, Contract Review Subcommittee recommend that the Board of Public Utilities approve a professional services agreement with the Center for Natural Lands Management of Temecula, California to serve as the endowment and conservation easement holder for the Kelly Farm Mitigation Bank in the amount not to exceed $251,975. And I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you, Mr. McNeil. Questions? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, how was the, in, in, in these processes where you're searching for an easement holder how is that, I'm just curious, how is that different than some of the other, you know, 
RFQs, RFPs, IFPs, like all the, like when you, when you go out to seek an easement holder, what is that, uh, what is that sort of notification process and, and uh, respondent kind of experience? Yeah, so um, there are a number of different firms uh, within the state that, that can do this. Uh, and so what we did is we sent out to all those in good standing our, our um, request for proposals to help us meet this condition, which is a, a condition that is um, delineated in the bank enabling instrument, which uh, allows us to build um, a mitigation bank and get credits for it. So there's a whole regulatory process. So of those entities that do that work in the state, we sent out the RFP directly to them. It's a small world of, of entities. Uh, at the same time, we've also worked with um, the county because Kelly Farm and all of our large farms that the city owns has an open space easement on them. And the, the interagency banking team is requiring us to um, put this easement above that conservation easement. So subordinate the conservation easement from open space to this easement. Um, and they need, this was a firm that they would also be comfortable with. So we had, uh, they had concerns that we wouldn't just pick, you know, obviously we have concerns that we wouldn't just pick a fly by night organization uh, that's just about the money, but that it's a, a firm that's dedicated to uh, natural lands, uh, preservation and management. Has that firm, um, it's just such an interesting process, especially with the, the overlay, right, on an existing, I don't know if, if that existing conservation easement it, is both agricultural and, because aren't there other leases on that farm or historically uh, on other parts of the Brown farm or sorry, on Kelly farm, Kelly farm, sorry, yeah. Yes, there, there are, are there are other uh, leases on Kelly Farm. Uh, this area was taken out of lease. Uh, we have been working with a farmer to pull the hay off uh, mm -hmm. the field as we've been getting prepared. Some of the concerns that have come back from the uh, interagency banking team has been around the nutrients in the soil. And so we haven't been irrigating or uh, fertilizing these fields, but we have been uh, pulling crops off of them for this 100 acre parcel. And we've seen a, a dramatic decrease in the soil nutrients uh, in the three years that we've been getting prepared for this. Right, right, I, I remember that process starting. Um, and has the local, is there any worry about um, the interface with agricultural preservation open space district in terms of like this easement holder working with them as a, now a subordinate easement is there is there anything anything we anticipate being an issue with that <laughs> so i will say it it's 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 been a challenge working on that component of this and uh once we have this entity's name we'll be able to finalize that uh, subordination agreement okay. um, with open space. Uh, and then uh, open space really sees that um, their easement and this new conservation easement have a lot in alignment. Yeah. The, um, the interagency team's concern is more around the, um, the future you know, because in our easement, it allows agriculture, it allows um, uh, recreation. So we have trails as a component of that. We've already built the trail on Kelly Farm. Yeah. So we've met the obligation under the open space easement for that property. But because that was in the agreement or in the easement, they do not want trails in the uh, mitigation bank, right. but they do allow and actually strongly promote continued grazing of the fields. Not, we won't be tilling and harvesting that way, but yeah. putting cows out to pasture um, would be our preferred uh, vegetation maintenance in this area. Interesting, and that, um, that was my next question, is that when, when we have a mitigation bank like this and we're doing that, 
at least the near-term monitoring, which I'm assuming includes like a biotic survey, CTS and others, um, the construction part when you're talking about, okay, we have an area where we've at least um, uh, verified the presence of CTS at some point during the construction or uh, construction is probably not the right word in terms of my mind. It's in terms of the uh, optimization, right, of the property for CTS habitat, which is why it would be a bank, right? You're optimizing and, and um, creating a better habitat for more, uh, you know, biotic concentration in the future, right? That is there, do we, this is a, maybe a, a dumb question, but it occurred to me, I'm like, do we, do we have to do, is there mitigation on the mitigation work? Like um, to do to do the work, you know, for preservation, does that require us to mitigate considering we verified the presence of CTS? Right. Um, you know, so there is not okay. um, uh, specifically for CTS, but if we were to have impacts to other regulated resources like wetlands native or plants. anything like that, yeah. uh, native plants. So we we've done the native plant surveys. We know where the rare plants are. So we'll have special treatment. So mostly what we'll be subjected to are what are called minimization measures, right. which would be minimizing impact. So one of the things we've gotten back from them uh, through our analyses, tiger salamander live in our area, they live in gopher burrows. Yeah. So we have gopher burrow density uh, maps uh, of the property. And so as a part of our construction, they're wanting us to avoid work in those areas. Okay, and so, uh, um, so there's okay. more of minimization measures that, um, because there is going to be a lot of grading uh, to get the everything to work. Um, so they'll be grading, but we'll also they're wanting we'll have to excavate out the the ponds, and um, and put in a clay, yeah. a clay liner. Uh, so there'll be large excavations with soil moving. So we'll have a whole host imagined, of yeah. minimization measures in the construction phase. And those are the things that have driven up the cost of the project. Right. No, that's I can't imagine the complexity of that from a, both the environmental and um, sort of biological opinion side, but then the, the practical side of, uh, you know, executing the habitat restoration and, and conservation for for the value of the bank right it's like on a site where you already know there's cts and it's very um I, i'm uh humbled to hear just how that process might go because i can only imagine the the complexity there knowing that in a lot of other sites we they consider them cts critical habitat in the santa rosa plain but they haven't monitored or verified the existence of cts on that site for you know decades right and mm -hmm. in this case we're like oh no no we have we have a good site on the flip side how are we disturbing one of the, you know a, a, a rare uh site in sonoma county where it where you have a verified presence presence of the species um with that restoration is there do you let do you ever do you get the opportunity to layer in any other mitigation bank um biotics like native plants and other things, or is it just CTS? We're focused on CTS um, mainly because that's our main need. Yeah. Um, you know, the process of developing a mitigation bank for rare plants is, is much more challenging um, oh, okay. and uh, getting them established. Um, it would be more difficult if those rare plants do repopulate in our area, or if there are opportunities for us to seed them into our bank, we would do so. Um, we will be putting native plants into these wetlands, yeah. uh, and we'll be, uh, you know, where I'll have a contract for collecting seed for a couple of years so that we'll have an adequate amount of seed to spread once we're done with the construction. Um, but you know, the only wet, the only credits we were hoping to get would be wetland credits, um, stackable wetland credits with the CTS. Thank you. I think you answered probably both of my questions, but just for clarity. So you mentioned in your presentation that there's an existing lease for growing hay. Has that lease been either expi expired or terminated or? 
Are we so, out of that? So the lease for this 100 acre parcel has expired. Okay. Yes. So you're just having the uh, lessee pull out the, the hay and do whatever. Okay. Right. Right. And, and the a nearby, you know, they're they're leasing a nearby part. So it's not that, you know, they're mobilizing their equipment out there. So they'll come out and, and okay. get it. Then my second question, you you alluded to the, the potential construction costs. And I was curious as to what the nature of the construction is. And you, I think you just then said um, you're going to be doing some lot, lot of excavation. You're going to be um, lining the pond. You're going to be putting in native plants. Is that kind of the general scope of the construction that needs to happen in order for us to get these credits? Yeah, so we'll be um, uh, increasing the quality of the fence on the property because if we're gonna be grazing with cows, we need a, a fence that can uh, handle cows. Uh, so we'll be upgrading the fence to metal post uh, fence so that there wouldn't be rotting out wood, you know, have a much longer lifespan. Uh, it will be somewhat wildlife friendly. We're working on that approach, um, but we need to also make sure that it's appropriate for the livestock that we're targeting uh, to do the um, vegetation management in the parcel. Uh, but a lot of the cost has to do with soil. Uh, so we're going to need to excavate a bunch of soil out and we're gonna need to bring in additional clay soil. Um, and so, uh, and then we'll, we'll impregnate that clay soil with a material that will make it less pervious so that'll hold water longer. Part of the tiger salamander lifestyle life cycle is that they need these ponds uh, to last long enough for them to uh, go from egg to um, a full development into an adult where they're walking um, and walk out of the pond. Uh, and we need them to dry out so that there's no perennial species like bull, bullfrogs or fish that get in there to predate them. Uh, so, so it's this mix of we, we need to get the, the water holding of these ponds just right that in various hydrologic regimes, so in a wet year and a dry year, these ponds are still filling up and they're still allowing the tiger salamander to complete their life cycle in most years. We can't do it for all years. We've seen some incredibly dry years in the last five year stretch um, that, you know, I wouldn't anticipate there would be much uh, lar the larval development wouldn't make it through. But the, the goal is to get it the right size to meet that. And that's what's become more expensive. We were going to use a synthetic liner, um, uh, which would have been a lot cheaper, a lot less uh, soil importing. And that's uh, not been allowed. Um, gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's no other questions. Entertain a motion. Uh, motion to approve the, the, it's a PSA professional services agreement, um, as listed in the recommendation. Okay. And I'll second that. We'll now open it up for public comment on item 3.1. If you wish to make a comment, please move to the microphone. Seeing no one move. We'll have a roll call vote, please. Board Member Grable? Aye. Chair Galvin? Aye. And that passes with two affirmative votes with Board Member Bowdenfort absent. Very good. That'll take care of item 3.1. We'll now move to item 3.2. Director Burke? Thank you, Chair Galvin and members of uh, the subcommittee. We will have our second item, which is the proposed agreement buy-in between Sonoma County Water Agency and the City of Santa Rosa for water quality trading framework phosphorus. Um, and Sean McNeil, our Deputy Director of Environmental Services, will be making the presentation. Um, and while he's calling that presentation up, uh, I just want to note on the last item, uh, the amount of effort and time that Sean has put into this. And um, I did, I think, smile when you mentioned open space. Um, he had to do a lot of work. Even I had to get slightly involved uh, in order to get open space to really work with us. And Sean has just done an amazing job and I just really wanna appreciate all of his hard work on that exciting project. So thank you for that. And now we'll go to item 3.2. 
All right, I, before I get started, I just want to say thank you, Director Burke, uh, but I also want to acknowledge that it's a team of us. I'm standing in front of you today. Steve Brady, who normally would have been here for that presentation, uh, has really been the key staff person, uh, but the easement stuff has fell, fallen on mine and the city attorney's desk. Uh, so, and appreciate all the support that we've gotten because we're, we're a great team. Um, so, uh, good morning. Uh, Chair Galvin, uh, uh, board, board Member Grable. Um, today I'm here to talk about an agreement by and between Sonoma County Water Agency and the City of Santa Rosa for Water Quality Trading Framework Phosphorus. Uh, I'll just give a brief history of the phosphorus requirements. I'll try to be very brief because I think you've probably seen these slides repeatedly, uh, but just for the record to have them uh, and go over the agreement with Sonoma Water and then talk about the next steps. So uh, right now we have, uh, starting in 2006, our discharge permit had a nitrogen and phosphorus zero net loading requirement added to it. In 2008, the city worked uh, with the Regional Water Board and developed uh, a program called the Nutrient Offset Program. 2009 to present, we've been implementing projects to meet this uh, requirement. Uh, in 2013, the city was successful in striking out the, the nitrogen requirement uh, of no net loading, uh, focusing on phosphorus as the limiting uh, nutrient driving the uh, biostimulation in the waterway. Um, and so in 2018, uh, the Regional Water Board adopted a water quality trading framework and it includes Windsor's treatment plant as well as having this provision. So the city and the town of Windsor are the two entities that are required. And then the new wastewater treatment plant that's being developed by the tribe in Windsor uh, is also going to have this requirement. Um, our phosphorus compliance strategy really is three parts. Uh, we really focus on maximizing reuse and minimizing discharge. If you think about that timeline I gave you, 2006, it's two years after we built the Geysers project. You could see how uh, disappointing it was to the city to then say, hey, look, we got this great project. We're not, barely going to have to discharge now. And now you get a no net load for nitrogen and phosphorus. But, um, but it is a goal of ours is to maximize our reuse and minimize our discharges. Um, We've also looked at and had projects looking at different ways we can make modifications to our treatment process to remove additional phosphorus from our, our treatment. And that has worked and has reduced the uh, concentration of phosphorus in our discharge. And that um, when we can't prevent discharge and we can't reduce the phosphorus down to zero, we offset our discharges via uh, the water quality trading framework. Uh, so we have four projects that we've implemented so far. We implemented a project on Beretta Dairy uh, where we're doing manure and pasture management. And that project continues to provide credits for us each year. Um, Pepperwood Nature Preserve is one where we went up there. We made changes to their failing road system, increased, um, decreased, excuse me, the runoff coming from that site that goes into Mark West Creek, uh, eventually into Mark West Creek, uh, which is a tributary to the Laguna, uh, or the Laguna is a tributary to it, depending on how you, where you sit in the watershed. Um, and that has, uh, produces credits for us each year as well. Uh, we also did the Ocean View Dairy Project, which was a big uh, manure removal in land application. We got a lot of credits, but we're no longer getting any credits from that project. Um, and then the Laguna 1 and 2 project, which we completed in 2019, uh, that was a creek restoration and sediment removal project. Uh, and that is continuing to provide a small number of credits, about 90 credits a year. Um, on that project, uh, where we got most of the credits up front on that project. So looking at these um, projects, uh, as far as their cost, the cost per credit, you could see the Beretta came in at $67 a credit. Um, we're getting a total of 7,600 uh, 7, credits over the life of that. We're getting 
approximately 400 credits a year from this project. Uh, the Pepperwood Preserve um, is uh, cost $512,000, um, generated almost 11,000 credits, and the cost per credit is only $47 for that project. Ocean View, uh, $474,000, provided 23,000 credits. Um, and those came in as a, a, a bargain basement price of $20 per credit. We don't anticipate that type of project in the future or that um, cost. Um, and then the Laguna One and Two, with great partnership with Sonoma Water, uh, they pretty much did all the work to build this project uh, and they generated uh, 19,000 credits um, for that. Uh, and that's, they're billing us $50 per credit. Most of those credits we've already banked. Uh, and then we're getting approximately 90 credits per year from them for that project. And we'll pay them $50 per credit uh, as long as we're getting those credits. And then uh, for future projects, the cost and credits we assume will vary but we do anticipate um, typically they're gonna be at our highest cost point and getting more expensive as we're doing projects that are um, the low hanging fruit first. Um, and so uh, wanna introduce Colgan restoration project. So this is a project also done by Sonoma Water. Uh, they were able to, we, we have a partnership with Sonoma State that helps us identify um, what kind of credits in, we could get from different um, sediment removal projects in the watershed. And they identified Colgan Creek as one of these, um, uh, a really good place to remove a lot of sediment that had high phosphorus content uh, in it. And uh, this is a stretch of Colgan Creek running from uh, Todd Road all the way down to Yano Road. Um, this is owned by Sonoma County Water Agency. They already have the permits to do this type of work. If the city were to do this without the water agency, it would probably take us two to three years just to get the permits to do that work. Um, so they were able to very quickly, we knew we were low on credits, to build this project out. Um, and in an effort to ensure that the, the credits happened la or the project happened, uh, this discharge season, you know, so that we could use it for this discharge season, the city agreed to handle the soil uh, off haul. Um, and so they brought that to a place that we have on one of our levees on Meadow Lane Ponds. We have a big open spot that drains to the pond, so it doesn't drain to the Laguna. Um, so we wouldn't have an impact on the Laguna, which is a, an important part of this. Uh, so here's a truck hauling it. Um, here is a look of that mound. Uh, you can see a dump truck there. It's about probably 12 to 15 feet in height, uh, compacted, uh, spreading. And then you can see the lower picture is a, a longer slide of it. This is what 19,000 credits looks like, um, you know, that much soil. So it's a, it's a good visual. We never really had that until we accepted the soil and then had them wrap it to see, wow, that's a lot of work to get those credits. And you got the white, the, uh, the white pelicans in there and the egret. That's great. Yeah. We have a lot of bird diversity in our ponds, uh, for sure. Um, so, uh, phosphorus credit summary, uh, this project generated 19,049 credits. Sonoma Water made 16,049 credits available to the city for purchase, um, and the credits will last 10 years. The other 3,000 credits are being sold to um, the town of Windsor. Um, these credits will only last for 10 years, so we'll, um, should we approve this agreement, we'll roll them in and we'll try to use our credits as strategically as possible to maximize. We have some credits, the Beretta Dairy credits only last three years. Uh, so we'll use those first. Uh, any one of those we, we get, then we'll use these. The Laguna one and two credits last in perpetuity. So we will hold on to those as long as we can. Um, Sonoma Water is charging $60 per credit for this project. 
uh, for a total cost of $962,940. Uh, they are also giving the city a $10 credit uh, per cubic yard that they that we received. Um, and so we received 18,585 cubic yards, which gave us a discount of $185,850 uh, for a total contract of $777,090. So where are we with our credits? Uh, this year, we we started this year off with 5,351 credits. Uh, this year, we did discharge and we used 4,982 credits, which was a lot lower because um, our concentration of phosphorus was lower this year. So we discharged almost the same volume of water as we did last year. Uh, but we're using about 2,500 credits less for that discharge um, because the phosphorus went down. What was the reason for the lessened concentration of phosphorus? We're looking into that. Our, our assumptions are that we did um, extended aeration uh, for a significant part as a way to deal with solids buildup in our process. So the extended aeration, uh, we saw that, but we're in the process of starting to say, oh, if this is something that'll work, we basically cut it almost in half, the concentration. That's what um, I'm like, can we duplicate that? Can we make it, can we optimize that? <laughs> yeah, so we will be looking at it. I mean, what's most important is managing our, our treatment plant process. And that will have to come first more than optimizing just for phosphorus. Uh, but this case, we, we were monitoring phosphorus levels at the same time that this change happened and we noticed that it, so we'll be looking at that more because um, it might be a, a relatively simple way, but we also want to evaluate because there's a cost of extended aeration. It's the water moves slower through the plant. There's more energy spent on uh, adding more air uh, per gallon of water treated. So we want to just kind of balance, figure out, is this exactly what happened? Why this happened? And then um, uh, figure out the economics uh, and the plant, uh, the appropriateness of manipulating that in the plant. But for sure, it's something that's made us very excited to look at. And we're cautiously optimistic. Um, so when you subtract the uh, existing credits from the amount we used this year, we would have remained with 369 credits. We would get approximately 700 credits uh, from our other projects. Those need to be validated first. Uh, and so that's, it's not known until they're completely validated. Um, and that if we add in Colgan reaches one and two, we'll have of we'll 16,049, we'd have a total of 17,118 credits uh, at, at the end of this uh, discharge year. And because of that, it is recommended by Santa Rosa Water uh, that the contract review subcommittee recommend to the Board of Public Utilities approval of the agreement by and between Sonoma County Water Agency and the City of Santa Rosa for water quality trading framework for phosphorus to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, questions? Board Member Grable? I admit, uh, I'm fine with it as well. So with that, I'll entertain a motion. I will move to approve the recommendation and the water quality training framework with uh, Sonoma Water on the, the Colgan Creek phosphorus. And I will second that. We'll now open it up for public comment on item 3.2. If you wish to make a comment, please move to the podium. See no one. May we have a roll call vote, please? Board Member Grable? Aye. Chair Galvin? Aye. That passes with two affirmative votes with Board Member Battenford absent. All right. That concludes our agenda for the contract review subcommittee meeting. So we are adjourned and we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>